I am Vipul Puri, Deputy Director with Competition Commission of India. Today we are going to discuss substantive provisions relating to regulation of combinations in India. The views expressed in the discussions are my personal views and do not reflect the views of either the Commission or any of its members. Let us begin today's session by recalling our discussions on the last module. We had discussed some basics of mergers and acquisitions including the reasons behind mergers and acquisitions, various forms of mergers and acquisitions and their significance in competition assessment and the merits and demerits of M&As. Thereafter, we had gone into the scope of the term combinations as contained in the Competition Act 2002. We discussed that whether a transaction requires mandatory pre-notification depends upon the assets and turnover thresholds as provided in section 5 of the Act and may be impacted by the regulations issued by the Commission and exemption notifications issued by Government of India. Today's module would take the discussions forward and is focused on understanding the regulation of mergers and acquisitions in India, that is the substantive provisions of the Competition Act 2002. The discussions include specific procedural aspects of regulating the combinations as per the Competition Act and the powers of the Commission for regulating the combinations. Thereafter, we would also discuss some of the factors which are relevant in assessment of combinations for AAEC, including the discussions on different forms of combinations for the purpose of competition assessment and various economic tools that may be applied in assessment of combinations. More particularly, we would discuss what are the procedural aspects of regulating the combinations as per Competition Act 2002, what are the powers of the Commission for regulating the combinations, what are the different forms of combinations for the purpose of competition assessment? What are the factors to be considered in assessment of combinations for adverse effect on competition? What are the various economic tools that may be applied for assessment of combinations? Let us begin our discussions now by starting with the procedural aspects of regulating the combinations as per Competition Act 2002. Let us begin with the procedure relating to filing of notification. The procedure relating to regulation of combinations start from the time commission receives notification from the parties. That is the first step in regulation of combinations is filing of notice. We have already discussed the conditions fulfilling which a merger transaction is held to be notifiable. Once the parties to the merger are sure that the transaction meets the thresholds and is notifiable, what is it that they are supposed to do? The answer to this question is contained in subsection 2 of section 6 of the Act. Let us first go through what the provision says. It says, any person or enterprise who or which proposes to enter into a combination shall give notice to the Commission in the form as may be specified and the fee which may be determined by regulations disclosing the details of the proposed combination within 30 days of number 1 approval of the proposal relating to merger or amalgamation execution of any agreement or other document for acquisition as referred to in clause a of section 5 or acquiring of control as referred to in clause B of that section. Let us now break up the section to extract all the relevant details. The section provides number 1, what is the trigger for notification? The section has given two triggers, one is approval of the proposal by board of directors. This is the trigger for merger or amalgamation transactions. The second trigger provided is execution of any agreement, execution of any agreement related to acquisition. Thereafter, it provides the period, period within which notification is to be filed. 
it says the period is 30 days from the trigger event. The section also gives us form of notification. It says the requirements relating to form of notification are contained in regulation 5 of the Competition Commission of India regulations 2011. There are two forms of filing a notification namely form 1 and form 2. Obviously, form 2 is more detailed. As per regulations, the notice shall ordinarily be filed in form 1. However, the parties at their own option may file a notice in form 2. The regulations also specify certain conditions fulfilling which it would be preferable to file notification in form 2. It also gives us the fees which is required to be paid. The amount of fee to be paid for filing a combination notice is specified in regulation 11. The fee payable for filings in form 1 is rupees 15 lakh and for form 2 filings the fee payable is rupees 50 lakh. Now that we have gone through the notification procedure, let us go into the post notification procedure of investigating a combination for any possibility of appreciable adverse effect on competition. The procedure for investigation to be followed by the commission after receipt of notice is contained in section 29 of the act and the regulations issued. The first step after receipt of notification is scrutiny of the notice. As a part of this step, the commission may direct the parties if needed to remove any defects in the information or to provide additional information which may be required for competition assessment. After this stage, the commission forms a prima facie opinion on likelihood of appreciable adverse effect on competition. If prima facie opinion of the commission is that there is no likelihood of AAEC, it would simply approve the transaction under section 31.1 of the act. If prima facie opinion of the commission is that there may be AAEC, it would follow the detailed procedure which is specified in section 29. Now, let us discuss what is the detailed procedure which a commission has to follow in case it is of the prima facie opinion that the combination may cause appreciable adverse effect on competition. The first step in this regard is issuing a show cause notice to the parties to the combination. The commission shall issue a notice to show cause to the parties to the combination calling upon them to respond within 30 days of the receipt of the notice as to why investigation in respect of such combinations should not be conducted. Please note that the time available for the parties to respond to the commission's show cause notice is 30 days. Thereafter, the commission will receive response from the parties. After receipt of response from the parties, the commission has an option to call a report from the director general investigation. The relevant section says that the commission may call for a report from the director general and such report shall be submitted by director general within such time as the commission may direct. Step 4. The commission will direct parties to publish the details of the combination. The commission may direct the parties to said combination to publish details of the combination within 10 working days of such direction in such manner as it thinks appropriate for bringing the combination to the knowledge or information of the public and persons affected or likely to be affected by such combination. The time provided for issuing this direction is 7 days from the date of receipt of response from parties if DG report has not been called upon and 7 days from the receipt of DG report in the other case. Step 5. The commission would invite objections from any person or member of public affected or likely to be affected by the said combination. The relevant provision says that the commission may invite any person or member of the public affected or likely to be affected by the said combination to file his written objections if any before the commission within 15 working days from the date 
on which details of the combination were published. Step 6. After all the information has been received, the commission would go back to the parties for additional information. The relevant provision says, the commission may within 15 working days from expiry of the period specified in section 29.3 call for such additional or other information as it may deem fit from the parties to the said combination. The additional or other information called for by the commission shall be furnished by the parties within 15 days from the expiry of the period specified in section 29.4 that is after issuance of instructions by the commission. After receipt of all information and within a period of 45 working days from the expiry of the period specified in subsection 5 that is after receipt of additional information from the parties, the commission shall proceed to deal with the case in accordance with the provisions contained in section 31. Now, what are the possibilities here? If the commission is of the opinion that the transaction is not likely to cause any appreciable adverse effect on competition, the commission may approve the transaction under section 31 1 of the act. On the other hand, if the commission is of the opinion that the combination has or is likely to have an appreciable adverse effect on competition, it shall direct that the combination shall not take effect that is block the combination by issuing an order under section 31 2 of the act. There may also be cases where the commission may be of the opinion that such adverse effect can be eliminated by suitable modification. It may propose appropriate modification to the combination to the parties to the combination under section 31 3 of the act. So far we have gone through two types of cases. The first is the case of approval of combination where there is no prima facie opinion of adverse effect on competition. And secondly, we have gone through the cases where the commission was of the prima facie opinion that there may be adverse effect. Another category consists of cases where the transaction is concluded to have adverse effect on competition and it may require some sort of modifications. Before going further, let us again recapitulate what we have discussed so far. We have discussed that when commission is of the prima facie opinion that the combination is not likely to cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition from prima facie stage, it would straight away go to section 31 1 order. There may be other scenario where the commission was of the prima facie opinion that the combination may cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition in India. Accordingly, a detailed procedure has to be followed and what is that detailed procedure? Number one, a show cause notice has to be issued to the parties and the parties have to respond within 30 days. Thereafter, commission has to decide whether to call a report from DG. Whatever the decision of the commission, the next step is requiring the parties to publish the details of the combination. If the parties publish details on the combination and the next stage which would be uh, the next stage which would be followed is asking the persons which are likely to be affected for their comments and after that an opportunity will be given to the parties to submit their final replies. After all this procedure has been gone through the commission would take a call if the combination can be approved under section 31.1 or if the combination is of such nature that it is pretty much likely to cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition, the commission may issue an order blocking the combination under section 31.2. There was one more scenario where the commission was of the opinion that the combination may cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition but the same can be eliminated by proposing a suitable modification. For modification cases, the combination would require some more procedure to be followed. Let us now go into those cases. So now we are discussing approval of combination transaction with modification. The first step in this regard is that the commission would propose appropriate modification to the parties to the combination. 
the step 2 is that the parties are supposed to accept modification or submit an amendment. If the parties accept the modification as proposed by the commission, they shall carry out the modification within the period specified by the commission. Failure on this part of the parties to carry out the accepted modification within the specified period shall lead to the combination being deemed as causing appreciable adverse effect on competition and dealt accordingly. On the other hand, if the parties to the combination do not accept the modification, such parties may within 30 working days of the modification proposed by the commission submit an amendment to the modification proposed by the commission under that subsection. In this case, the commission would decide on modification submitted by the parties. If the commission agrees with the amendment submitted by the parties, it shall by order approve the combination under section 317 of the act. If the commission does not accept the amendment submitted, then the parties shall be allowed a further period of 30 working days within which such parties shall accept the modification proposed earlier by the commission. If the parties fail to accept the modification proposed by the combination within 30 working days, the combination shall be deemed to have an appreciable adverse effect on competition and be dealt accordingly. Thus, after having detailed discussion on various procedures to be followed, we are in a position to summarize the various scenarios of merger filing. A merger filing may be approved at the first stage if there is no prima facie concern of adverse effect on competition. In cases where there is prima facie concern, a merger filing may be further investigated and thereafter either approved without modification, approved with modification or completely blocked. After discussing the various issues relating to investigation of combinations, now let us come to what goes behind, what is that is to be, what is required to be done for the assessment of combination transactions. Let us discuss some of the economics behind the concepts. The first step of merger assessment requires identification of the form of a combination. There can be different classifications made. The mergers can be classified as horizontal mergers, vertical mergers or conglomerates. In case of horizontal mergers, the parties to the combination are involved in production of similar goods or services. For example, a merger of two cement manufacturers. In such cases, there is a definite lessening of competition. Therefore, what is important to find out is whether there is likelihood of appreciable adverse effect on competition or not. The analysis of such transactions requires detailed consideration of unilateral and coordinated effect, contestability analysis, efficiencies, etc. The next classification is vertical mergers. These mergers involve backward or forward integration. Here, the parties to the combination operate at different stages of production and distribution process. For example, a transaction between a channel broadcaster and a direct to home operator. Conglomerate mergers. In these type of merger transaction, the parties to the combination are involved in diverse and unrelated activities. These type of merger transactions do not normally raise the concerns of any adverse effect on competition. As I had stated that in case of horizontal mergers, the assessment is focused on unilateral and coordinated effects. Let us very briefly discuss that what do we mean by the terms unilateral and coordinated effects. Unilateral effects arise when the merged group is profitably able to reduce the value for money, choice or innovation through its own acts without the need for cooperative response from the competitors. In very simple words, the firm acquires a status of such dominance that it is in a position to act independently of the market forces of demand and supply. On the other hand, coordinated effects arise when under certain market conditions, the merger increases the probability that post merger merging parties and their competitors will successfully be able 
to coordinate their behavior in an anti-competitive way, for example, by raising prices. A detailed study of unilateral and coordinated effects forms the basis of assessment of all merger transactions, but more particularly horizontal mergers. Now, we move on to the other factors which are relevant in competition assessment. The most primary and the most significant factor in competition assessment is the state of market concentration. The market concentration is prima facie the best indicator of likelihood of unilateral and coordinated effects. The economic theory provides a certain quantitative measures to assess this factor such as Herfindahl index which is simply called as HHI and concentration ratios. HHI is obtained as the sum of squares of the market shares of the firms comprising the market. The theoretical maximum value of HHI according will be 10,000 that, that will be true for a monopoly. The HHI figures are used to assess the likely concentration of market post merger. The US guidelines on horizontal merger 2010 provides safe harbors to interpret the HHI values to eliminate concerns of competition. The general classification used by the US guidelines are as under. The markets are believed to be unconcentrated if the HHI is below 1500. The markets are believed to be moderately concentrated if the HHI value ranges from 1500 to 2500 and a market is supposed to be highly concentrated if the HHI values are above 2500. However, a merger may not suddenly become anti-competitive just by the fact that HHI values are high because there are certain industries in which concentration levels are generally high. So, we have to consider another factor to assess the impact of the merger and this is incremental HHI. When using the HHI, the competition agencies in US considers both the post merger HHI level and the increase in HHI resulting from the merger. This is relevant to find out the impact of particular transaction being assessed. The normal criteria employed are as under. Small changes in concentration. Mergers involving an increase in HHI of less than 100 points are unlikely to have adverse competitive effects and ordinarily require no further analysis regardless of the total HHI post merger. In unconcentrated markets, mergers which result in unconcentrated markets are unlikely to have adverse competitive effects and ordinarily requires no further analysis. Just to clear it, the first point I stated was that if the incremental HHI is less than 100, then regardless of post merger HHI, there are no likely concerns. On the other hand, I have stated that whatever be the incremental HHI, but if the post merger HHI is resulting in an unconcentrated market, that is the post merger HHI is less than 1500, again there would be no concerns. In cases where mergers result in moderately concentrated market, that is the post merger HHI is between 1500 and 2500. Further, an incremental HHI is more than 100 points it may potentially raise some competitive concerns and may warrant detailed scrutiny. In case of highly concentrated markets, the mergers which are resulting in highly concentrated markets and involve an increase in HHI between 100 and 200 points may potentially raise significant competition concerns and warrant detailed scrutiny. In fact, the regulation says that mergers resulting in highly concentrated market and having an incremental HHI more than 200 may even be presumed to be likely to enhance market power and this presumption may have to be reverted by persuasive evidence showing that merger is unlikely to enhance market power. The next tool for measuring uh, the state of concentration is concentration ratio. A concentration ratio is a measure of total output produced in an industry by a given number of firms in the industry. The most common concentration ratios are CR3 and CR4, which means the market shares of the top 3 or 4 firms. 
after having a detailed assessment of the state of concentration, there are other factors specified under section 20 subsection 4 of the act, which are also to be considered. Some of the most relevant factors are number 1 degree of competition between the acquirer and the target. It may so happen that the HHIs are higher or the incremental HHIs are also higher, but the competition would be most impacted if the parties to the combination are close competitors. That is the products of two firms are viewed as close substitutes for each other by the end consumer. Thus, whether there is direct competition between the parties to the merger or whether one of the merging firms is a maverick firm which could have had a huge competition impact is also a very important factor that has to be factored in competition assessment. Thereafter, we have also got to assess the competitive ability of the other players. The merger analysis has to focus on the size and resources of the competitors post merger. The analysis is required to examine whether the competitors would be able to constrain the market power of the merged entity or they would be relatively weak and more prone to coordinate their behavior with the merged firm. The analysis also focuses on entry barriers in the form of cost and regulating regulatory barriers. When assessing barriers, the guiding factor is likelihood of timely and effective entry. Therefore, the analysis may look at the instances of past entries in the industry and their impact on market competition to reach a determinative position. Further, another very relevant factor, so far we have the factors so far discussed are more to do with the competition. One factor which could also impact the merger assessment may come from the side of consumer and that is the countervailing buying power of the consumer. Whether the buyer can constrain the merged firm on account of its own size or its importance as a customer to the merged firm provides clue on the level of competition remaining post merger. Apart from all these factors, another factor which needs to be considered is the efficiencies. The mergers offers synergies which may be firm specific such as cost savings etc. as we had discussed in unit 1 of this module. There may also be efficiencies which may lead to development of newer products, technology or may lead to lower price. The consideration of efficiencies whether firm specific or general is very important and is used as a trade off with the adverse effect on competition. Then there are certain other factors which may also go into merger assessment such as the nature of the industry, whether sunset or sunrise industry, degree of vertical integration, sector specific regulatory framework, framework. all these factors may also be relevant to competition assessment. Now that we have gone through two major parts of discussions in this module, first we have had a look at the substantive provisions which are involved in investigation of combinations and the second is the economic insight that is how it is assessed whether a merger transaction is likely to cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition or not. Let us now summarize our discussions for this module. The regulation of combinations has two broad aspects. The first relates to the legal procedure to be followed by the parties and the commission right from the stage of notification till the issuance of final order. Our earlier discussions in this module centered on this aspect. The second is the assessment of a transaction leading to the final order. The cases notified to the commission may be approved, they may be approved with modification or they may be blocked in accordance with the procedure contained in the act. At the core of any decision of the commission however, lies the competition assessment particularly for horizontal and vertical mergers. The examination of unilateral and coordinated effects include an in-depth qualitative and quantitative analysis specific to the case. There are a number of factors that can be considered in assessing mergers, but the overall guiding principle is a trade-off between the pro-competitive effects and the anti-competitive effects. 
it may be noted that all the mergers have both the aspects. There might be some pro competitive effects of a merger and there will also be some adverse effects on competition. Thus, what is required is that all the factors are to be considered in totality. The decision has to be based on the net adverse effect on competition after considering the efficiency arguments, after considering the pro competitive arguments which may have been given by the parties or which may have come up during the competition assessment. Thank you.